Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, beginning with verse 4. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth below or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our subject for today is idolatry. And the way I want to approach this, I want to go back in time to 1963. In 1963, the space program for our country was in its infancy. America's involvement in Vietnam was beginning to escalate. And we were beginning to see the first stages of the British invasion, the Beatles coming to America. You remember the mop-haired group that made all the girls swoon when they played their music. I was in kindergarten at that time, and our teacher every morning for music would teach us songs and we would sing together. And then she allowed us to be a little more creative. She would let groups of us, if we wanted to, to get up in front of the class and lead the class in songs that we like to sing. And every morning, everybody egged us on, but Richard Peacock, Hugh Nall, Lamar Henson, and I would get up and lead the class in singing Beatles songs. And they loved it. I remember the first Beatles record I ever got. It was one of those 45 records with a song on each side. On one side was, I want to hold your hand. And on the other side was, I saw her standing there. I can even remember the song to this day. One, two, three, four. Well, she was just 17. You know what I mean. And the way she looked was way beyond compare. So how could I dance with another woo and I saw her standing there? Well, she looked at me and I, I could see that before too long, I'd fall in love with her. Now how could I dance with another woo and I saw her standing there? Well, my heart went boom when I crossed that room and I held her hand in mine. And we danced through the night and we held each other tight. And before too long, I fell in love with her. So I'll never dance with another woo, and I saw her standing there. Well, it's not Shakespeare, but it worked. And I idolized the Beatles. I aspired to be Paul McCartney and John Lennon and George Harrison and Ringo Starr. Until... March the 4th, 1966. And on that day, the Evening Standard published an article in which John Lennon was quoted as saying, Christianity will shrink and vanish. And we are more popular than Jesus even now. Well, Christians everywhere were irate that he said that. And later he apologized, but the Archbishop of Boston said he was probably right. In essence, more people were willing to worship the Beatles than Jesus Christ. And the topic today is idolatry. The Ten Commandments, the Second Commandment, you shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not bow down to it, and you shall not worship it. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. There are two observations that I want to make about this commandment this morning. 
The first is it is pretty clear that there is a prohibition against idolatry. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not bow down to it, and you will not worship it. It's pretty clear. But what is an idol? You remember the story of Moses, how he led the people out of Egypt. They gathered around Mount Sinai. Moses went up onto the mountain into the midst of the the smoke and the thunder, and he received from God the Ten Commandments. The story tells us that Moses went up on the mountain, and he was gone for a very long time. The people down below became anxious and figured something had happened to Moses. And so they pleaded with his brother Aaron uh, to make for them an idol, an image, something that they could allow to be the representative of God, of Yahweh, that they could bow down and worship it. What they were trying to do is appease God and to get God on their side. Of course, what happened is Moses got the Ten Commandments, he came down off the mountain, he saw the people groveling on the ground in front of this golden calf, and he lost it. He smashed the Ten Commandments, the tablets on the ground, turning them into rubble. When we think about creating an image, what's wrong with idolatry, what's wrong with creating an idol as a representative of God is our first mistake is we are limiting God and we are saying this is what God is like. And God is so much bigger than anything we can imagine. When we create an image for God, we are also creating it as a good luck charm as a prop, as something that we hope that will bring us good luck. That's the problem with idols. They limit God, and they are our attempt to try to control God. You know about the movie Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's one of my favorite movies from a number of years ago. Indiana Jones, uh, living in the midst of World War II, is in a race against the Nazis to find the lost Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant belonged to Israel from Moses' day forward, and it contained in it the Ten Commandments, the staff of Aaron, and a pot of manna. And the people carried it before them. And when they finally built the temple, they put it into the temple. It represented God's presence with them. It had been lost for centuries. And according to the movie, people were looking for it. Those that were financing the search for the lost Ark of the Covenant covenant, believed that the nation that had that, the army that had that as it went into the battle could not be defeated. A good luck charm. It was a a symbol that God was with that army. God would have to fight for that army. Instead of looking for the Ten Commandments and displaying the Ten Commandments, What about living the Ten Commandments out in your life? There's power in that without shrinking into idolatry. Earlier this year, Jamie Jenkins and I took a group of folks from the church to the Holy Land. And on the last day, the culmination of our trip was a visit to the Garden Tomb a place that some believe was the site of Jesus' resurrection. It is a quiet place. It is a meditative place. It is a beautiful place. And you have an opportunity to go and to visit this first century tomb that people believe might have been the place where Jesus was resurrected. Now, four years ago, when I was last there, uh, there was a door that went into the tomb. 
And on the door, there was a plaque that said, he is not here, he is risen. But this year, when I went, the door was gone, and I asked uh, the guide, where's the door? And he said, oh, we had to take it off its hinges and put it away. Pilgrims were coming, and they were going into the, the tomb, and they were shutting the door and barricading it, and while others were taking chisels and taking stone off the wall to take home as a relic. Instead of a relic that reminds us of the resurrection of Christ, why not have a relationship with the risen Christ? There's power in that without shrinking into idolatry and, and worshiping a stone. In this passage, we are encouraged not to fall into idolatry. Not to worship things, but to worship God. Not to count on things to rescue us, but to look to our relationship with God to sustain us in every time of need. And that's the first observation. The second, very quickly, is about that last line where the Scripture says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Frankly, I, I, I don't think that's a good look. I, I wish that wasn't in there, that description of God being jealous. I think of jealousy in very negative terms. I think about people who are insecure. I think about people who want to control other people. I think about people who get their feelings hurt very quickly. And is that what the biblical author is saying about God? In my reading this week, I discovered that biblical scholars believe that we are missing the boat when we ascribe those qualities to God's jealousy. Rather, we need to look behind the jealousy to see what is there. And what is behind jealousy? It's love. Think about your high school sweetheart, your first girlfriend, your first boyfriend, and you found out they were jealous. You were seen talking to somebody else. Now, you might think poorly of the other person, but more likely you felt, wow, that person likes me. That person loves me. Jealousy can be the most flattering thing you can come across. And for Israel to hear, God is a jealous God, there's love behind that. God wants the best for the people of Israel. God loves these people. God cares about these people. God is with these people. And that could be the first acknowledgement that they have of how much God loves them. And so it comes to us as well today that God loves us. I know you may be sheltered in place, and feeling more alone than you have ever felt in your whole life. You're not alone. The Lord who loves you is with you. I know you may be unemployed and the days ahead are uncertain. You're wondering how you're going to pay all the bills. And you are concerned about your future. We well, hear the good news you're not alone. God sees you. God knows your needs. Even the, head, the hairs on your head are numbered. God knows you that intimately. And therefore, do not be afraid. For God and you have got this. We are in this together and we will move through. I was reading an article earlier this week in which the authors were trying to use a weather metaphor to describe the times through which we're living. And one suggestion is that we are in the midst of a blizzard. And if that's the case, we know how to live through a blizzard. You hunker down. You wait it out. 
It'll soon be over. And then life returns to normal. The author said that's a possibility. Or it might be there were the beginning of winter. And it won't be over very soon. It's a season through which we're going. And we know how to get through the season of winter. We change our behavior. We do things that enable us to survive an extended period of time of cold. We'll get through. And the season will be over. Or, the authors suggest, that we might be at the beginning of a little ice age. An ice age is something that lasts for years. And in order to get through an ice age, you can't just pivot and wait for things to change. You have to change. It requires vast changes on our part, socially, economically, and spiritually. I don't know which it is. I don't know if this is a blizzard. I don't know if this is the beginning of winter. I don't know if this is the beginning of a little ice age. But I do know that we need to be prepared. It's a time to get back to the basics of our faith, to get back to what we know is true, that we are God's children and that God is our God and we worship God and we see life through the lens of our relationship with God. When this is over, I wonder what we'll look back and remember. I wonder what images are going to be indelibly imprinted on our brain. I wonder what we'll be like when we're able to get out without people telling us you have to be in. Who will we be in those days? I don't know the answers to those questions for you or even for me right now. But what I do know is that it is important for us to know who we are. And you are essential. I am essential. We are essential together. God loves us. And God offers us a relationship that sustains us through this time and enables us to see life as God intended for us to see it. A man was traveling with his daughter on an airplane. The little girl had never been on an airplane before. She was seven years old. And he gave her the window seat so she could look out and look down on everything as they flew by. And the little girl was so excited, she kept saying, Oh, Daddy, look, look, there's a farm. Oh, Daddy, look, look, there's a lake with boats on it. Oh, Daddy, look, look, there's a golf course. And her dad didn't even look up from the magazine. He just kept, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then he realized that maybe she, in her excitement, was, uh, was causing irritation to people around her. And so he announced to everyone sort of loudly, please forgive my daughter. She still thinks that everything is wonderful. Well, the day is coming when we will see once again that everything is wonderful. It's not that the circumstances around us change, but the lens through which we look changes. It changes us as a result. And we remember even the hairs on our head are numbered. So, I still love the Beatles. I love their music. I love their songs. But I don't idolize them. I see them in the proper context, in the balance of life. When we put God first, others second, ourselves third, life is in its proper perspective. May that be so in your life and in my life this week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.